seventh medieval history journal annual lecture. Um, since Morris, who is good, Morris M. R. is going to give the lecture, since he's here, let me very, very briefly uh, recount the history of how a medieval history journal came into being because Maurice has a very uh, intimate connection with its, uh, with its coming into being. Uh, sometime in 1997, when India was celebrating the 50th year of its independence, it occurred to some of us that there are several Indian journals in the social sciences, possibly also in the natural sciences, but we are not very much aware of them, but certainly the so social sciences, which are read internationally, which has respected internationally very much, uh, but these are focused on India primarily, not primarily, almost exclusively. Uh, journals like Indian Economic and Social History Review, highly respected journal, contributions to Indian sociology, uh, but these are journals focused or centered on India. So we thought after 50 years of independence, can't we have a journal which is not merely journal edited and published from India, which is not merely read internationally and respected internationally, but its content should be international. Uh, and uh, that's how the idea of a medieval history journal came along. Uh, we first thought of a very uh, flamboyant title, International Journal of uh, Medieval History or something. Uh, the inter, yeah, International Journal of Medieval History. Uh, but for two reasons we dropped that. One was uh, there is already an, a journal of medieval history published from uh, Amsterdam. And the second was uh, uh, we went with this proposal to uh, the only publishing house, respectable publishing house we could think of, Sage, which was then headed by uh, the grand old Tejeshwar Singh, uh, six foot four inches tall and with a booming voice, <laughs> which, but very, very friendly voice nonetheless. Uh, uh, we went to him with the proposal, uh, slightly, uh, slightly diffident in the sense that Sage was not known for publishing history texts or journals, uh, and certainly not medieval history texts and journals. But we went nonetheless because that was the only place we could think of. We went to him and suggested to him that we'd like to publish it. He uh, probably liked the idea that it should be an international journal and therefore he said, okay, I will. And he suggested that, you know, uh, you can call it international journal, but you know, the real test of being international is that it should be, it sh its content should be international rather than, pro uh, the, rather than a proclamation that it's international, which is an idea which appealed to us. So we toned it down to medieval history journal. Uh, where does Maurice come in here? Well, he comes in here because Mr. Tejeshwar Singh uh, uh, was excited with the idea, but he was also running, he was not running a charitable house, he was running a commercial enterprise of publishing. So he laid down the condition that for first five years, you have to bear the first, the entire cost of production, which, is, which was at that time about 60,000 rupees for two issues, 30,000 rupees each. Uh, appears small sum now, but at that time, it was a huge sum for, you know, it would probably have been equal to a, a, a year salary for me. <laughs> now it is a professor's probably 50 days salary, but at that time it was at least six months, if not a year salary. So we couldn't think of, think of financing ourselves. So it was then that I approached Maurice MR, uh, my old friend Maurice MR, who was the administrative uh, director of the, the magnificent uh, uh, institution, Maison de Sciences de l'Homme in Paris. And uh, I said, yeah, we are thinking of this and we need these finances. Will you think of it? And it didn't take a second for him to say, yes, of course, go ahead. So that's how Morris comes in, you know. And without uh, Morris's help, the journal couldn't have come into existence. So that's why I told you this long story of why Morris and the Maison de Sciences de l'Homme is uh, very intimately connected with, with, the, with the journal. And of course, since then, uh, in about five years' time, we had become self-sufficient, so we didn't need any more help from either from 
Maison or from ICHR also came in to help at one time. We did need that, so we said thank you very much. But since then, uh, Morris has been a constant source of support, constant source of help to uh, to the medievalist journal. Uh, we really can't thank him enough for what he has done for MLJ. Uh, while when we when we when we when we were uh, ten years old in uh, 1997, I think I'm, I'm sorry, 2007, 1998 was the first issue. 2007, we were ten years old. It uh, we decided to go in for two other uh, sort of branches of of our activity. One was to launch a, an annual lecture, Medieval History Journal annual lecture. Uh, and the first annual lecture was probably held in 2010 or something, uh, or maybe nine, uh, with help from Indian Council of Cultural Relations, great help from there. Uh, this is the seventh lecture. So far we have held lectures by uh, Professor Azizul Azmi, Chris Wickham, Richard Eaton, Jean-Claude Jean Schmidt, Susan Reynolds, uh, uh, Selvik Pamuk, and this year's Morris Semar, the seventh lecture. And next year, we have booked uh, Prasannan Parthasarthi to give the eighth uh, Medieval History Journal lecture. So uh, this was one of the projects that we had undertaken. And we are, we are as you can see, the, I read out the names to, 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 let, to let you know that uh, you know, we, we get the best of historians, the front-ranking historians from around the world to deliver these lectures. And uh, with cutting edge kind of research, uh, that's the kind of uh, speakers we get. The second project didn't come off at all. We thought of, uh, we thought of uh, uh, publishing books on medieval history, not medieval Indian history, but medieval history around the world, establishing ourselves as a publishing house for medieval history. That fortunately perhaps didn't come off. <laughs> the infrastructure required but would have been far too far too demanding, so we didn't uh, get on with that. But a third project which has come off, which came off day before yesterday here, luckily and wonderfully, was the project of seminar. So we have, we have had a great seminar two days ago, and we plan to go on with a series of seminars uh, in the, in the, in the not, not regular seminars like these lectures, but uh, irregular seminars, but nonetheless seminars um, uh, under the ages of Medieval History Journal. That's for Medieval History Journal. But uh, Maurice Amar, uh, I've already introduced you, uh, to Maurice Amar to you in the context of Medieval History Journal, but that's not the only context in which he, uh, I would like to introduce him. Uh, Apart from the very, uh, uh, very, uh, very, very close, uh, nearly four-decade-old friendship that uh, Morris and Morris uh, has been kind enough to accept me as a friend, very, very close friend, family friend, virtually member of his um, immediate family, virtually. But apart from that, he has also been a constant source of encouragement personally to me, but more than me, uh, the two volumes that Morris, uh, mainly Morris edited, called French Studies in History, uh, published in India. Uh, my name is also attached, but you know, it's 90% of the work he did, and he allowed me also to attach my name to it. Uh, the idea, this was published in 1988 and 1990, the two volumes. The idea was that uh, you know, India is so tied up with the British empiricist historiography uh, because of colonial legacy uh, that it's not even aware, Indian historians, professional historians and students are not even aware that there is an alternative tradition of historiography and it's just as well that we bring it to the notice of Indian historians. And therefore, uh, two volumes, about 35 or 36 articles of the best of French historians, from Marc Bloch to Lucien Febvre to Jacques Lagoff to Georges Duby, and so on and so forth. Their articles, the articles which had been already published in English, we took them up, and the ones which had not been published, uh, had not been translated into English, we got them translated in India by Indian historians who knew both French and English. And these were published in two volumes, 
uh, first volume called the inheritance and the second volume called the departures uh, this has been a, this that was one of the one of the one of the finest collaborations that i've had with any scholar uh, anywhere and i have had several uh, morris himself is a is a is a very very uh, what shall i say uh, I'm feel almost because of my close friendship, I almost <laughs> feel embarrassed talking uh, in superlative terms about him, but he does deserve those terms. But uh, his work on, uh, on uh, five volume, edit edited five volume Storia de Europe, de, de, de uh, in, in Italian, uh, uh, in Italian, yes, uh, co-edited co with uh, uh, with who? Uh, Perry Anderson, Paul Barros, the best of historians, Walter Barbier and Carlo Ginsberg, they are, and along with Maurice Semar, the five volumes of the story of Europe published in Italian. Italian is virtually his second mother tongue. His uh, edited volume, Dutch Capitalism and uh, World Cap Actually, Maurice started as an economic historian under the training of uh, Front Fernand Bradel. And his early work is on economic history. Dutch capitalism and world capitalism is one. Venice and Reguse and, the, and we trade in the second half of the 16th century. It's still in French, not translated into English. That probably is his first work. Uh, and the lecture that he's going to deliver today comes from, it's, it's, a, it's a further, uh, not elaboration, but further development of a marvelous essay that he has written on friends and neighbors, that's the title of his essay, in um, a four-volume uh, work on a hist the history of private life, published from France and then from uh, then in English in 1986 and 1989, respectively. So clearly, Maurice has moved from purely economic kind of history to a much wider field of social history or much wider field of of the of the of the history of mentalities at its at, as 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 its epitome as it were, and therefore uh, what he's going to talk to us today, in a way, uh, he has been practicing that kind of history for a long time, and therefore uh, what we can look forward to is is a is a very stimulating lecture today. Uh, this lecture will be published uh, in the next issue of Medieval History Journal, as always, in the April issue of Medieval History Journal. So uh, uh, it will be available to all of you in written form. Uh, may I request Maurice Semar to deliver his lecture? I have first of, of, of all one obligation to thank all of you that are in this room, but to thank especially Arbans Mukia for all what he said and for this invitation. This invitation was important for me for many reasons. I should say only two. The first, because it gave me the opportunity to come back to Delhi after 22 years. My last, I, I visited very often India between 79 and 92, but my last visit was 92. But uh, the second reason, but it is evidently a great pleasure to be there with you again and to meet uh, many colleagues that I met either in Delhi time ago or in Paris uh, after. <laughs> but um, it gave me the opportunity to reopen the file that was important for me, the file uh, that I organized about uh, 30 years ago to write this essay on friendship uh, for the, the history of uh, private life or of privacy, I think it is translated in English, by privacy. And I, at this time, I committed myself, I was the director of the Maison, I thought that I had no time to write a book on it. And I decided I should keep it from my, the age of my retirement. But I retired uh, uh, quite uh, fine, eight years ago, and I did not seriously uh, realize this project. And Arbans gave me 
the opportunity to come back to this uh, topic and to decide to write seriously this book, to prepare it. I hope to live long enough to have the time to arrive to the end of this history. I shall start uh, from a famous and very often, uh, often uh, uh, le uh, quoted lecture that was, uh, that was given to the young students of the normal school in Paris uh, by, um, uh, and published by the Annal in 1941, exactly one year after the French defeat, but I'm sorry, uh, after the French defeat uh, of 1940, when Paris was occupied by the German army. Lucien Fèvre wrote, we have no history of love, of love. We have no history of death. We have no history of pity, nor of, of cruelty. We have no history of joy. Songs to the Semaine de, songs to the Semaine de Synthèse, uh, organized by Henri Baer, we have we had a quick outline of an history of fear. It is enough by itself to show us the great interest of this kind of history. It is uh, evident that what I call for is not a study of love or of joy during all the periods of time and in all the civilization. I only point to a di direction of research. I ask for the opening of a large and collective inquiry on the basic uh, feelings and on their ways of expression. This text has been sometimes, I think wrongly, misinterpreted at this time, and even still today, as, as if its purpose had been to lead the scholars away from much more topical and important research subjects that could have attracted the attention of the German and on the French and of the French censor, and uh, and of and, uh, and of which um, l'étrange l'étrange défaite l'étrange défaite sorry um, l'étrange défaite uh, strange defeat in English written by Mark Bloch between July and September 1940 as a personal reaction to the condition and to the reasons of the defeat of the French army but published only in 1945 after his death in July 1944 and the end of, after also after the end of the World War II. This is a book of Mark Bloch that may be seen uh, as, the best, uh, as, the best, uh, as the best example. Defeated one year before, France had accepted the condition of uh, accepted the condition of the armistice imposed by Germany, and it was divided in two parts, including par one, including Paris occupied by the German army, and submitted to the direct control of the German police, the Gestapo, and the other, called Free Zone, submitted to the authority of the field, Marshal Pétain government, that was settled in Vichy and had decided to collaborate with Germany. Another interpretation was more broadly accepted later in the after-war context, and it looks to me more consistent with the real situation. Lucien Febvre had made in 1940 the choice to go on with the publication of the Annal, in spite of the anti-Jewish uh, anti uh, 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 decision of the Vichy government that forbade to Mark Bloch to be, as a Jewish, to be officially his co-editor. And uh, he had disagreed very strongly on this subject with Bloch, who finally agreed to go on writing in the journal under uh, the, the transparent uh, pseudonym of Marc Fougère. But, uh, Lucien Ferro would, at any cost, keep alive a journal that would be identified with a uh, living and innovative history, and propose all the renewals of the curiosity and of the interest of the, of the, of the historian. Sorry. Um, his, call of nine, his call of 1941 became quickly, from the year 1950 onwards, 
at least in France, the founding uh, text of an historical psychology that would go beyond the individual attitudes and reaction and focus its attention on the collective sensibility. It means on the sentiments and on the emotion. The conception and representation that inspired, um, that inspired them, the modes of their expression through words and gestures, gesture, I say, including silence, but also smiles or tears, etc., etc. Their change in time and in space, their differences according to the social milieu and the culture, the words that were used to say and describe them, and the norms that aim to direct them and to control and to regulate their uh, practices. This ambitious program fitted well with the perspective drawn 10 years earlier by Fer himself in his, in his first lecture to the Collège de France in Paris, when he explained that history has to be written as an answer to a problem, to a question put by the present to the past, and that the, uh, that the historians had to use for these answers all kinds of sources of documents. Fev wrote the text, yes, but all the text, and but also not only the text. All the text means for the historian no, uh, not, not to limit himself to the documents produced over the time by political, administrative, military, or religious authority, or, or to all kinds of manuscripts, and more and more from the 16th century onwards, printed texts of what we call literature, an attitude that, was, that, uh, that identified up to very recently the birth of history with the invention of writing and with the first official text that we know in Egypt and Mesopotamia. But the historian has to take in consideration all categories of private, of private writings everywhere they have been conserved as they have been written from a different point of view point of view that we should call today from below and not from the top, for, um, um, from a more individual level and not from the authority level, and for different readers. And for this reason, these texts give us, at least to those, those who are able to and interested in reading them, informa information of a very different uh, of a, very different, uh, of a very different kind, very useful to the historian who have accepted that history needs to be written not from one, but from several different points of view. And when Fevre was saying not only the text, he means to look, to look in a systematic way to a large range of documents, existing or produced and made available and open to interpretation and scientific use by new technology, but that have been still and uh, that have been and still are neglected by historians. For uh, for example, uh, for example, all the documents related to archaeology, cartography, images and their copies and reproduction, painting, design, incision, sculptures, and so on photographs, movies, ethnographic, uh, uh, ethnographic researches, but also botanic, zoology, and so on. The list was already very long for Fevre in 1951, but would be much more longer today as a result of the application of scientific analysis methods to all the tra traces of the past, but also to the development of the of laboratory experimentation in the field of uh, in the field of social sci sciences. Let us think, to give an example, for example, uh, to the development by social psychologists using both film and computer of researchers on the non-verbal expression. It means what you say with your hands and with your face when you are talking to somebody even when this somebody is very far from you on the telephone and does not see you. 
The program of Fevre was partly achieved by historians mainly after his death in 1956. Let us think we can quote the history of fear by Jean, by Jean de Lumeau, to the quite, uh, can quote the la quite large number of studies dedicated to the history of death, Alberto Tenenti, Philippe Ariès, Michel Vauvel, François Lebrun, or to the history of love, including its sexual dimension by Jean-Louis Flandrin. Other fields have been less generally studied, like joy, pity, and cruelty, even if the interest with this last matter has been increased very recently by the emerging new forms of violence that come to, to compete with the pretension of the state to impose, to impose on violence its own monopoly. Our society rediscovered as something to study, uh, as something to study and to understand the pleasure that men have to killing not only the individual, but also the collective killing that can reach the dimension of a genocide, as in Rwanda or in Bosnia. But we may be surprised by the words missing, uh, on, missing on the list of favor. For example, laughter, to which Jacques Le Goff dedicated for several years his own PhD seminar, but at not the time to write the books that he had an announced. We can only read today the long article he published in 1989, Laughing in the Middle Ages, that has been reprinted in 1999 in four another Middle Ages. Are also missing, for me, aid and friendship, two words that form with love a cluster of words and sentiments of which none can be studied in a totally independent way from the others. And two, love and friendship, have the same antonym. It means eight. But, uh, but, anyway, the, but anyway, the result is there. The reception of the message of Fevre has been one of the main factors of a dynamic approach that convinced the historian to reformulate their researches around sensibility and sentiment first, then mentalities, then representation, before de dedicating, dedicating themselves to the necessary deconstruction of these analytical categories. As for myself, my interest for the history of friendship was a result of, combination of, of a combination of circumstances in quite a particular context. As it was said, it was the elaboration of the third volume. Uh, the, it was the third, third volume, oh, no problem, dedicated to the early modern period of an history of private life, of which Philippe Ariès was the editor, and he was substituted by Rocher Chartier after his death, in agreement to the interpretative line from his research of the invention of childhood that looked to him happening during the same, during the same period, early modern period. Ariès started the discussion with us, proposing to organize the volume around the core, the core idea of an invention of the private life that would have been the key change during this three or four centuries of the early modern period and was linked for him, was linked uh, for, uh, for, for, for him uh, to another invention, the invention of the individual and of individualism. I must say that I had more or less the same reaction that two days ago when the title of, of our seminar proposed to us a kind of transition from command to consensus where I see much more, much more a more or less permanent or long-run coexistence and tension between both under different forms and in different contexts. For this reason, I suggested to Ariès and my other colleagues a more contextual approach, less one-way oriented 
and more open to the chronological gaps, to the differences and internal contradictions, an approach that will start from a detailed analysis of the relation of the single individual with the different partners of their personal and uh, uh, personal and social life, and of the way in which their own conception and management of these interpersonal relations could contribute to their integration in a larger network of interpersonal relations, of which, uh, uh, of which each of them was only one single component, but that constituted the social environment of which they could use the potentialities and resources, but had to accept the, uh, con the constraints. The family had, in this context, a central importance. The influence of anthropology, for many historians of my generation, it was a real discovery, had promoted the family from the end of the year 1960 onwards to a core position for most of our researchers. And we have started giving, uh, more, uh, giving more attention 